Hello, everyone. My name is Brett Anderson, an undergraduate fellow with the Eisenhower Institute at Gettysburg College. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Eisenhower Institute's second panel on US-China relations organized by the undergraduate fellows. This year, our program is examining the rise of the Chinese economy, military, and its emergence on the global stage in recent history. Our theme for this year is titled U.S.-China Relations, Is a New Cold War Coming? As we hope to discuss the potential areas of competition and collaboration within the two nations. In an earlier panel discussion, Ambassador Stapleton Roy and Dr. Bonnie Lin discussed the forces and events of the last 50 years that led us to the current state of relations between the U.S. and the PRC. In this panel, we invite both Winston Ma and Rudy De Leon to discuss the current state we find ourselves in. Winston Ma is an adjunct professor at NYU Law School and is the author of The Digital War, How China's Tech Power Shapes the Future of AI, Blockchain, and Cyberspace. Our second speaker, Rudy De Leon, is a senior fellow with the National Security and International Panel Team at American Progress. He has worked at the organization since 2007 and focuses on U.S. national security issues and U.S.-China relations. This panel will conclude with a Q&A session, so please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom so that they may be answered later. With that being said, I would like to invite our first speaker, Professor Ma, to begin the discussion. Yeah, okay. So. Um, I'm very glad to come to this session uh, because personally, I'm a big beneficiary, ben big beneficiary of U.S.-China cooperation and synergies. But my recent book title is "The Digital War," so uh, it's, it's interesting setup. Um, so, when you look at my my background, you know, I got undergrad education back in China, semiconductor physics, and then law school. Uh, and then 1997, I, I came to the States uh, with scholarship at NYU Law School uh, for Master of Law. So I became a lawyer in both China and in New York. Uh, and then from Davis Polk, uh, New York, uh, I transitioned into investment banking, uh, JP Morgan, uh, as well as Barclays Capital New York, uh, totally 10 years at the Wall Street, uh, which gave me the background to join CIC in 2008, China's sovereign, China's sovereign investment fund uh, to make global invest, investing, including for, for four years, I was based in Toronto, Canada as the head of North America office, you know, still working on a lot of US investments. Um, so, and now I'm back to New York, uh, back to the private capital markets, uh, VC found in the metaverse, uh, working on uh, SPAC transactions, and also adjunct professor at NYU Law School, you know, where, I, where I graduated like 20 years ago, right? So I'm very much a US-China cross-border person and, and very much benefit of that. And I certainly hope that we will see more of that uh, US-China collaboration going forward. Um, now, to, to begin this discussion today, right? I want the, the audience to think for five minutes, five seconds, <laughs> five seconds. When you, because today I'm gonna focus on China's internet economy, uh, the digital economy, which has uh, a tremendous national security implications, you know, in the China-US context. So, so for, for the audience, right? Maybe just think five seconds. You know, when you think about China's internet economy, what kind of pictures will come to your mind? Yeah, what would you think of? Yeah, uh, because you're all familiar with some of the Chinese internet giants, right? So I guess some would say it's WeChat, right? Uh, it's billion user social network, like the uh, chat. It, it is like the Chinese version of Facebook, and but plus Instagram, plus WhatsApp, plus Uber, everything, right? Even even fintech, you know, it's on one super app. If someone may think about that. Or if you're a big fan of e-commerce, right? You may think about the Singles Day shopping festival. You know, every year, November 11th, you have this 48 hour, 24 hour shopping extravaganza, right? Um, and uh, 
it, it is a global festival, uh, not only within the China market. Uh, it involves vendors, buyers, sellers from more than 200 countries. Um, last year, you had close to $75 billion transaction volume within 24 hours, right? So that, that's, that's a showcase of the e-commerce power of, of, of China. Alibaba, right? Famous name. Or some people may think about the mobile payment, right? Uh, China is viewed as uh, is viewed as going into a cashless society very quickly, um, and the mobile payment was very popular in China, uh, reaching one billion users. Uh, now, what's interesting is right, Tibet was the first province to reach ninety percent of mobile payment penetration. Uh, but the reason is simple, right? You know, in, in places, remote places, without traditional infrastructure. Uh, the, the new new technologies such as mobile payment became very popular, right? Uh, now, but I would say these are the pictures of yesterday. And today, China's digital economy is focusing on new digital technologies, much more than mobile internet, as we have seen in the context of WeChat, e-commerce, or mobile payment, okay? So what was the inflection point? Uh, that was 2017. 2017, if you re recall, 2017, there was a historical match for the Go Chess game. You know, it's a traditional game played in China, Japan, Korea. Um, and then in 2017, the historical match was between the algorithm from Google called AlphaGo and the best human player in China. Uh, and, and that game was ripe with suspense and symbolism, right? You could say it's a human versus machine, or you could say it's about tradition versus modern or intuition versus algorithm, right? You, or, or like East versus West. Uh, but in a way, the, 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 the symbolism is like, China versus the US, China. You, you, could, you could view that way. And what's the result? Um, in straight three to zero win, the AI algorithm beat the best human player. You know, the, what we saw was the best human player left crying after the, after the loss. Uh, now the implication is more than just a chess competition uh, because overnight, Chinese tech companies change their, you know, change their mindset. In the past, it was all about smartphone, mobile payment, and uh, mobile internet user traffic. That, that's all they care. But now, uh, but after that historical game, they realize the new technology is, is, is in AI and other digital technologies. Um, which are driven by data and intelligence. So since 2017, the new keywords have been data and intelligence. And, and maybe it's a coincidence, it was a coincidence, but it, several months after that game, right, in the summer of 2017, China released a government plan calling China to become a dominant AI leadership position by 2030. So AI is a new battleground, you know, for, for, for China's competition with the U.S. Uh, in the tech race uh, since 2017. Uh, and, and just like Google in the U.S., Chinese tech, tech giants uh, taking on AI. Uh, you, you know, Alibaba used to be known for e-commerce, but now today it is also a big AI uh, player. Uh, so that, that's behind my... Uh, two books, right? 2016 book title was China's Mobile Economy, but as was introduced, you know, my re most recent book title is The Digital War because the focus is different. Uh, China's mobile economy time focus was on the mobile internet. And today the focus is on AI, blockchain, and the cyberspace digital technologies like a cloud. Um, uh, China's mobile economy time was mostly consumer focused, but now it is the, the digital economy is much more enterprise focused, uh, the, the capabilities of enterprises are uh, very similar to the US. Um, 
that that's sort of the background of the discussion today. So, uh, I, uh, so in the following pages, I will cover a few more areas that the U.S. and China are competing with each other. Uh, in addition to AI, uh, blockchain is is another interesting uh, area. Uh, in 20, 2019, uh, Chinese pre, Chinese President Xi called for more research and investment into blockchain. Uh, it was it, it is it was viewed as a critical technology going forward. And now the, the, what's really interesting is that represented the first major economy uh, leader to acknowledge the importance of blockchain because it is an interesting but unproven technology. You know, that, that shows China's interest in new frontier technology. And, and they, when they see the opportunity, they will jump on it, right? Um, so, what the, the immediate implication of that blockchain focus is the digital currency. Uh, China has tested uh, crypto, uh, digital yuan, you know, digital Chinese currency uh, at a large scale within China. Uh, and it is poised to become the first major economy to launch a digital currency. As we know, right, the US Federal Reserve uh, only in 2020, you know, a month ago, started to issue in a discussion paper uh, about the prospect of a digital dollar. But China has tested this for a few years. Right? And in recent Winter Olympics, uh, for the first time, the digital yuan was tested with international users because you have athletes from about 100 countries going there. So, so the digital yuan was tested for the first time with international users. Um, and going forward, uh, China, going forward, China is going to spread this digital currency outside of China into, into uh, global countries, which will lead to a competition with the US dollar and potentially challenging the supremacy uh, of US dollar in the global financial system. Uh, now, someone will say, wait a second, right? I knew that China prohibits uh, uh, crypto trading. And yes, that's right. But, but that's that's really interesting because China wants to control the financial side of crypto, but at the same time, China really focused on the, the technology side of blockchain. Um, and so these days, China is talking about developing its, its uh, own China-specific NFT platforms, which can potentially uh, co-play with the uh, uh, digital currency of the country. Um, now, the final section I want to uh, uh, final final session is about the, the third area of competition, semiconductor. Right, um, China, China is a big importer of semiconductor from the U.S. Like in 2016, uh, China import imported more than 300 billion dollars worth of semiconductor chips from the U.S., almost like 15 percent of total imports. Uh, and it, it may be recognizing that the U.S. is a ha U.S. has a control a, some kind of controlling power on, on, on that supply chain. Uh, in that year, China set up a $30 billion semiconductor fund, uh, which aims to promote technology uh, IND in the semiconductor areas. And now, and after that, something really interesting happened, you know, like uh, some real cases showing the direct uh, actions from the U, uh, by China and U.S. government in this uh, semiconductor area. Now the example is uh, SMIC, the company SMIC, a semiconductor manufacturing international corporation. Yeah, so it was a Chinese. It, it's a Chinese company, um, but it was listed in New York Stock Exchange, uh, and then a, a sequence of very interesting activities uh, happened. Right, 2020. You know, the 30 billion semiconductor fund uh, put in $2 billion plus investment uh, into that company uh, from that fund plus other Chinese uh, sovereign money. And uh, the, the same year, um, it was listed at the Shanghai Star Board, which is like the NASDAQ equivalent, equivalent in China. Uh, so it, it, the, the company's market cap reached all time high, right? Uh, but that didn't last too long because in the same year, later 2020, it was put on the entity list uh, by the US government. So the, so the company cannot get access to advanced uh, equipment in the global market. 
um, in the 2021, uh, the company delisted from all US exchanges, including New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and the, for the major indexes like MSIC, MSCI and other indexes, they take the, uh, the name of, of take SMIC off the indexes, you know, because it's on the blacklist of the US, right? Um, so this, this is a, a very interesting case of like both countries are taking actions. You know, China using sovereign capital to support it, but US is gonna uh, take a government actions to slow down its uh, innovation process. Um, so now I have to have this, this page to complete the story because in, in some way the two countries are doing very similar things. Uh, uh, semiconductor, China's behind, right? So China set up a government fund to promote it. And the 5G, US is relatively prime, behind. So US is fighting Huawei, Chinese 5G player with Chinese, China, China, China style sovereign funds, uh, very similar. Uh, so US set up like a three vehicles to do that. You know, uh, the, the, the Congress talked about a billion dollar 5G tech IND fund to promote 5G research. And also there's a Washington DC institution called Development Finance Corporation, DFC. You know, it has a deep pocket that can potentially, uh, that, that is talking about uh, uh, investing into 5G research, including 6G, the, the next generation of 5G. And then there were also uh, uh, another idea uh, presented by the, 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 the past, uh, the, the, the last term attorney general to, is to set up a holding company to take control stake in the two European 5G companies, uh, Ericsson and Nokia, <laughs> to eat, both preventing it, in, it get into the hands of China as well as have more control of them so that they can become a, a kind of the extended arm of the US, right? So very similar. So, so to conclude, right, what we see is uh, the, con to, what we see is that the take race between the US and China uh, is, is continuing because the, the tech race will determine the uh, outcome of the economic power competition between these two, uh, the, the two largest markets right now, right? Uh, that, you know, last year, you know, after the Trump uh, Biden transition, a lot of people expected that, had the good intention to expect that it will be a different story, right? Uh, but in reality, you know, the tech race stays, you know, even though Trump, even though uh, the, the, the transition of Biden and uh, Trump happened, uh, because, you know, at the beginning of Biden, Biden's term, uh, one of the things he's, he announced is to create a big plan uh, to promote domestic production of semiconductors, right? That, that includes many uh, efforts to build up uh, semiconductor capabilities on the land of the US. And of course, you know, China is, was, uh, is still on this uh, tech race, you know, uh, around the uh, Biden's, uh, the, start of, the start of Biden's new term, uh, China announced uh, a bigger and a bigger spending on IND in what, what is referred to as frontier technologies, because uh, for, for the new technologies, uh, they become the uh, new frontiers of US-China competition. Uh, so, so I conclude here, I turn to uh, Rudy for a US perspective. Well, first, uh, thank you, Professor. It's a privilege to be with the students at Gettysburg here tonight and uh, to share the discussion with um, such a distinguished uh, expert uh, operating out of New York, the financial side of the global competition right now between the US and China. Um, talks need, need uh, titles. And so my title for you is the US and China. Are we going to be locked into a cold war of ideologies or can the two countries find ways to work together to solve big global prob problems. Um, climate change is one, but as we know, as fresh as the day's headlines, uh, how the global powers may help to mitigate and resolve the tensions that are going on between Russia and Ukraine right now with a remarkably unified uh, Europe um, backing the Ukrainians and trying to isolate Vladimir Putin um, we see uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China 
as uh, two unique superpowers play out very, very much. Now I should add that um, in addition to being at the Center for American Progress, um, which has been my, non, my career in the nonprofit world since 2007. And one of the great aspects of that job is I get to hire people like you to come in to get your first real working experience in Washington, DC. And um, uh, so when President Obama became, was elected in 2008, um, seven of my 13 direct reports went directly into the administration. And that same model is true um, with the election of uh, Joe Biden in 2020. Um, I did serve uh, before coming to the nonprofit world. I had a corporate career. I also served um, eight years in the Pentagon for President Clinton, finishing as the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the number two civilian. Uh, and went through the Senate confirmation process three times, which is a unique professional experience to have. And then um, for eight years prior to that, I was the staff director of the Armed Services Committee in the House of Representatives uh, in the 1980s and early 1990s. So um, I've had a career on Capitol Hill, Article One of the Constitution, a career in the executive branch, Article Two, and then one in the non profit world. Now at CAP, um, we were uh, from 2009 to 2016, usually making two trips, two engagements, dialogues um, with, uh, with China, um, sometimes in Washington, uh, sometimes in Beijing or Shanghai or even Chongqing, um, sometimes in Honolulu or Tokyo. But uh, it was a back and forth. It's what's called as a track two, which is a dialogue of informed former government people who uh, can experiment with various ideas and proposals and then report back to the White House and State Department when we would return. Um, I would also do some of the track twos with uh, the Center for Naval Analysis uh, going to uh, Beijing. Um, as, as well. So a lot of back and forth and there's no substitute for primary source discussions. There are a lot of people who will write very interesting articles, but the ability to talk and engage with people um, is I think key to an understanding to running a good track too, let alone how to advise government policymakers on something like the US and China and where we go from here. So as the professor said, the three technologies that are gonna define the competition going forward are 5G, artificial intelligence and cloud computing. We need all three of those technologies to go forward. And unlike the 1960s when leading technology to fly to the moon and do other things was really generated by NASA and other government agencies. In the tech world, it's the global private sector that is really driving innovation, driving new systems, and really changing the, um, the, um, the platform on how we conduct our conversations, our dialogues, and our global business. So 5G, artificial intelligence, and cloud computing, and this really creates a very interesting dynamic. Uh, let's just take the 5G, where on one side you have a sort of government-sponsored entity, Huawei, um, that is not profit-oriented, uh, competing against private enterprise in the US and in Western Europe uh, to make the jump from 4G to 5G. And so our uh, telecommunications industry in the West is not as strong as a government-sponsored entity. So the competition between the China model and the US model in terms of the generation of the next level of technology um, is very vigorous and it's also different models. It's the private sectors of the West competing against government sponsored investment coming from um, the Beijing side. And just to further point, and I see uh, Matthew has already asked these questions, the primacy of the dollar and the primacy of Western financial markets, primarily in London and New York, has been a given. 
uh, China, Russia, the BRICS, about a decade ago, were trying to find an alternative currency to the dollar, but they weren't able to succeed. And uh, the dollar, whether it's digital or currency, uh, the dollar is sort of the formula for trading oil, buying cars from Europe, uh, transacting textiles and Nike shoes that go from a manufacturing uh, originally in Beijing, now cascading down to Vietnam and elsewhere. Um, the dollar is still the principal currency for determining value in international trade. The Bitcoin is really not geared to any technology. And so these cryptocurrencies are sort of a new model, but just as 5G and AI and cloud computing are gonna be critical, you know, the fate of the digital currencies going forward is gonna affect everyone that is part of this broadcast and listening. A um, Couple of other comments for you, and then we can get into the, the Q and A. Um, I was 16 years old when the unexpected announcement came that Richard Nixon was gonna to go to Beijing to meet with Mao Zedong. Um, this created a huge shockwave simply because Nixon had been the ultimate cold warrior and Mao, the great revolutionary of China. And if you go, so uh, I've been in the government, I've written a lot of speeches, delivered a lot of speeches. I've developed a knack for getting primary source information for, for speech material, but dig out the notes from uh, the Nixon um, Mao Zedong article. It's, it's not a long conversation, but um, right off the bat, Na Mao is prodding Nixon in a humorous way over the fact that America's traditional friend um, in Taiwan, Chiang Kai-shek is not happy. Mao says to Nixon, you're not, your friend is not happy that you're sitting here and sort of laughs it off. And um, Nixon tries to exit the conversation, uh, but Mao is having a grand time sort of back and forth. It's an extremely interesting conversation. It lasted maybe 40 minutes um, and it was not really significant to the Shanghai communication that would be produced. It was the fact that both Mao and Nixon needed that picture of the two together to signal that uh, globally and internally in China, and of course in the US, that China and the United States were opening a new page. Uh, Mao dies in 1976, four years later. Um, and uh, Deng Xiaoping comes to power and it's the beginning of the modern China that we see today. I know some of this has been discussed. Deng Xiaoping had a strategy, which was build strength, hide your intentions. And uh, Zheng Zemin and Hu Jintao um, entered into the same, same period of engagement. The United States passes permanent normal trade relations with China in 1998. It was a divided vote in Congress. I uh, remember meeting with the President Clinton and being asked to go and work the Hill to try and generate support for this agreement. But it really opened up to full trade between the United States, China, and China and and the West. Uh, Bob Zellick, who was George W. Bush's uh, trade czar, basically said that this was an era to see whether China could become a global stakeholder and play the role of a global power in a constructive way. Uh, the whole world sees the new China in the 2008 Olympics. Vice President Biden has a visit with Vice President Xi where he hosts him in Washington, D.C. and in Los Angeles. And uh, no surprise, the Los Angeles visit is structured around a visit to the Staples Center so that Xi Jinping uh, can see Kobe Bryant play. The one condition to the advance team that went out was uh, President, Vice President Xi is anxious to meet Kobe Bryant, but he doesn't want to meet any regular citizens while he's there at the Staples Center. 2011, the transition, Xi Jinping becomes the leader. And at CAP, we're into our second group of track two dialogues. And by this time, we have a number of American students out of Princeton and the University of California um, who are uh, completely fluent in Mandarin and can give us the real translation of what uh, senior officials are saying versus the more sanitized 
message that sometimes the trained translators give. And so we have a session in the Great Hall of the People where the point is made that, that under President Xi, not only will China be a great superpower, but it will be a great superpower managed by the Communist Party. Uh, and that unlike the Soviet Union that fell apart because they could not manage their economics, uh, and unlike Mao who unleashed a cultural revolution which divided uh, the Chinese people uh, against each other, um, he was not going to, he was aware of these two, two skeletons, but the party would lead China into this new, new phase. Um, right off the bat, she takes on three hard tasks uh, dealing with corruption, uh, dealing with pollution, because anyone who's been to Beijing knows that there are weeks that go by where you don't see the sun during the week and there are no clouds. It's just simply the thickness of the smog. And then the third category was terrorism, mostly feared coming from the West, from a minority population that we see now in the vigorous uh, repression of the Uyghurs in camps. And so um, these are part of two summits that President Obama has in the United States with Xi, one in Palm Springs, seeing if there can be a new form of major power relations, and then a follow-up um, in uh, 2015 at the White House in the Oval Office. I'd say by 2015, relations were a little more frosty than they were when they had the California summit in that it's clear that the uh, theft of international, of, of, of intellectual property is being pirated. Uh, the personnel records of most US government officials, including myself, have been uh, hacked by uh, China um, hackers. Uh, and so um, the White House summit is testy in the sense of how do we get back onto this relationship of win-win uh, uh, while dealing with major problems like climate, like human rights uh, between the US and China. So I'd say that 2015 is clearly a critical year in the dialogue between the US and China in terms of what's next. And then Trump comes and right off the bat, China is the enemy. Um, uh, he is reported to one former US diplomat is saying he's down at Mar-a-Lago and in the, there's a dinner going on. And at the beginning of the dinner, President Trump is pledging that she is going to have the most delicious chocolate cake he's ever had. Uh, and by the end of the dialogue, uh, the US has hit chemical uh, warfare sites in Syria and uh, President Trump is boasting of the great military power that was unleashed against the Syrians that night. So um, competition with China becomes the new term. It comes to dominate certainly the 2017 to 21 uh, period of US-China relations. And so as president returns, um, you know, he knows Vice President Xi. And so President Biden and President Xi, can they find a path forward? I think that's very much up in the air. And the test will be resolved in the technology competition, the financial and trade competition. But I think just as important, uh, can the US and China do big things globally together, like um, climate change, like the North Korean proliferation, like human rights, and like the Iranian nuclear program? Um, I think that's the challenge going forward. I would say that, uh, Part of those that wish to see an immediate Cold War between the two sides look at China as being 10 feet tall in all capacity. And I would say that's not the case. Uh, the uh, government in Beijing has really clamped down on the tech entrepreneurs. Uh, Jack Ma, probably not a relate, relative to the professor, uh, was one of the leading entrepreneurs of China. And you know, when the party takes over the management of entrepre entrepreneurial activities, you scratch your head and wonder, will they have the same dynamic and the same vitality that they have from an entrepreneur who wants to 
develop the technology, make money, and create new markets. So um, this is where we are right now. I think there's a test in terms of how will Xi Jinping respond. It's pretty clear that the uh, press in Beijing is already trying to distance uh, Xi from his agreement with Putin, decided the week before the Olympics that said they were really united on all policy issues and that uh, you know Xi had a right to in, engage with Ukraine in the same way that China had its historical rights to, um, to Taiwan. And so now I think he looks at the horror stories that are being shown to the rest of the world. And you know the question around both in the government uh, and outside within Europe and back and forth to our friends in Asia is uh, how does this crisis in Ukraine end? And can there be a diplomatic solution? Uh, what we saw the first week of activities is that um, the Russians are not particularly good at uh, mobilizing uh, quick response power like the West is. Uh, the vehicles, the convoys are running out of gas and needing tankers for refueling. So instead, what we're now seeing is Russia returning to the tools that it used against S Syria, in a horrific way of humanitarian destruction, which is their long range artillery fire into uh, cities and into large population centers, uh, not so much focused on um, going after military units. So I think the challenge for Beijing and Washington is can they avoid a Cold War, find the way to um, agree with pass forward in these domains and solve big problems. Back to you, Brent. Thank you, Mr. DeLeon and Professor Ma. We will now move on to the question and answer portion of this panel. For the audience, if you have any questions to ask the panelists, please feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Our first question is for Professor Ma. What role does the digital Silk Road play in China's efforts to establish a digital economy? Yes. Um, in one sentence, right, it, it is a way to expand China's digital economy power uh, from a domestic economy phenomenon into a global, uh, into a global impact. Um, when you look at the digital Silk Road, right, um, it, it's extension of the of the earlier Belt and Road Initiative. So, just for the background of the people here, you know, Belt and Road Initiative came came up uh, earlier, uh, like 2014 ish. Um, and it, it's about developing roads and other connecting, uh, actually roads and marine routes, you know, to connect the Eurasia area, uh, such that the uh, uh, such that the the the, the, the trades in that region will be greatly improved. Uh, so, so the belt refers to uh, uh, refers to the land, you know, starting from China into Kazakhstan. Uh, into Middle Asia and then uh, go go all the way to Europe, um, Italy, uh, UK, Spain, etc. Uh, that's the belt, right? And then the road is actually the Marine Time Silk Road, and that's uh, China going south uh, to to Southeast East Asia and then uh, enter into the Africa region. Okay, uh, now that 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 was mostly related to traditional infrastructure. Uh, power plants, uh, reservoirs, toll roads, uh, high-speed trains, right? But the digital Silk Road came, 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 came as a new dimension to the Belt and the Road. You know, it, it is the digital dimension uh, of this global connectivities. Um, so, so the keywords here are different, right? Now we're talking about 5G networks. We're talking about cross-border data flow, right? And, and late, latest, you know, you can even add blockchain, like a blockchain networks into the uh, digital Silk Road concept. Uh, so, so, so to summarize, you know, the, the digital road initiative is to extend the Chinese uh, digital economy into, 
into the rest of the world, right? Because physical Belt and Road are still limited by geography, but digital in the size space, it can reach every country, right? Um, and uh, the implications will be profound because it's about ecosystem, right? We all, like when we look at uh, any digital applications, it's all about the ecosystem. Like Apple, Apple is very powerful because it creates this ecosystem, not, a, uh, not only including uh, billions of users, but also a huge number of developers, you know, who will create new applications on the Apple ecosystem. And the same is for digital infrastructure, right? When, it, when, we, when you get into, let's say a cloud uh, and a, a cloud get, get, gets into the, the get against to, you know, a huge number of countries, you know, it become a dominant player. It will improve its services, you know, maybe more competitive on pricing. Um, and, more, and more importantly, you know, it's, it, it, it will have a lot of data to, to work with, right? Uh, and it will, uh, and even more importantly, it will attract large number of developers uh, and programmers uh, to, to, to come to that ecosystem. Um, so, so when we look at the digital Silk Road, right? Number one, it will connect the countries, uh, basically. Uh, and the second level uh, is about creating this ecosystem, right? And then thirdly, uh, I think the more subtly is that uh, the digital economy is still globally, it's still at its uh, early stage. Uh, so whoever creates a, a big ecosystem right now, uh, essentially will develop the new standards for cross-border data flow, right? Uh, and, and that is a, a, a huge factor for the competition in the cyberspace going forward. Thank you, Professor Ma. Mm. Uh, Mr. De Leon, you touched on this already a bit, but does the ultimate outcome of the conflict in the Ukraine offer lessons to China and Taiwan? What are some important similarities and differences between the two situations? Um, good, good question. I think any sense that uh, Taiwan um, is an immediate target of, of Beijing, I think is diminished by the world reacting to Russia moving into Ukraine. Uh, the Taiwan issue, um, you know, back to Nixon, Nixon's trip uh, with Mao Zedong and Cho Enlai in um, 1972, uh, the U.S. agreed to something called strategic ambiguity. Uh, we weren't going to make it a big issue, but uh, uh, as one proverb that was offered, which is solve the day what can be solved today, and leave for tomorrow, that can only be solved tomorrow. So I would say uh, that the tension point in Taiwan is vigorous. Um, you know, it, the, the young people in Taiwan and the young people um, in the People's Republic are all very enthusiastic, very interested in engagement with each other. The little white earbuds that are a uh, symbol of Apple, you can see that in, uh, in, um, in uh, Taipei, you can see it um, in Shanghai or anywhere else, just like you can see it in the Souk um, in the United Arab Emirates uh, or in the West Bank of Israel. So um, I think the, the, the vicious nature of what's going on in uh, Syria or in, in Ukraine right now will be very so sobering for the Chinese leaders to watch and to not get into uh, that which would potentially be quickly become a superpower confrontation. Thank you, Mr. De Leon. Our next question is for Professor Ma. The economies of China and the United States are deeply intertwined, with China being the US's biggest merchandise trading partner. How could escalating hostilities between the U.S. and Chinese governments affect the economic relationship between these two countries? Very great questions, uh, because uh, luckily, you know, that's uh, that, that's that, that's a trillion dollar relationship that can still keep the two countries talking to each other. Right. Uh, if you think about the uh, the last two decades uh, in the U.S. helped China went into you know got into the WTO, which led to a tremendous growth of China's import export uh, businesses, uh, especially with the U.S. Uh, last two decades, uh, 
And it was a very, it was a great scenario, right? It was a great scenario because China manufactures and then China sells, you know, exports to the U.S., right? And so U.S. got cheap goods. Um, uh, at the same time, China gets a huge surplus of foreign reserve in U.S. dollars. And where do they put the money? Uh, mostly in the U.S., right? They, uh, China is the, uh, uh, for, for most of the time, uh, is the number one buyer of U.S. treasury bonds uh, and, and also invested uh, investing in U.S. capital markets uh, in, this, in the stock market as well. Uh, so, so during that time, you know, it was, it was a very good scenario, right? China was manufacturing consumer goods and the U U.S. is importing uh, and the China will importing from the U.S. Uh, high-end semiconductor chips, things like that, right? But now things changed. Now things changed. You know, the, the, in, in a nutshell, uh, uh, China and U.S. are now at the same starting line for the future digital economy, right? Because uh, China, it, during the last two decades, China did a big catch up uh, uh, relating to the mobile internet economy. Uh, during the last, last decade, you know, Chinese tech companies are always known as the copycat of the Silicon Valley companies, right? Uh, Alibaba is like the Chinese version of eBay at its early days, right? Um, but today, when you look at Alibaba, it's the combination of uh, Amazon uh, because it has a big cloud business, uh, it, and plus uh, YouTube, uh, Netflix. Because it also has ent entertainment arm, and of course, it is also kind of PayPal, right? Because it, it has the biggest uh, mobile payment uh, uh, app in China, so on and so forth. So, so, so what? So what? What you can get from here is that. Chinese companies has, has uh, passed the first phase of copying the US and now they are in the same space. The same space, just like Alibaba Cloud, you know, uh, competes with Amazon Cloud in Southeast Asia. Um, uh, so back, back to this question, right? Uh, we, 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 we have to recognize the, the changing context. Uh, in the past, it was complementary uh, economies on both sides and now, uh, in, many, in the new digital economy context, they are direct competitors. But in some parts of the economy uh, in China, we still have this trillion dollar relationship. And it is still there. It is still there. Uh, so so, so to, to me, this is, this is something good to have uh, because this, this makes the two countries have to talk to each other. Uh, that's how I look at it. Uh, I don't know if Rudy, you want to have more um, comments on that yeah well so i think you're right the, i mean the in the uh early days after the permanent trade relations microsoft made huge investments in the china market um now it's sort of lost some of its market share and so uh they're challenged by that but i think you know amazon microsoft and google are all global players and i think um jack ma and alibaba are global players as well I think the test is uh, who gets to create the infrastructure for these next generation technologies. The British had agreed to a deal with Huawei on the 5G, uh, <clears throat> but when they understood the fine print of what it meant for the rest of Western Europe, uh, they sort of took a step back and slowed down. So if there were, <coughs> excuse me, if there were common standards for the infrastructure and each side could build their own, um, you might have a balanced uh, trade market but where one might get a competitive edge over the other i think that's uh, on the commercial side now on the military side each 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 side will be vigorous to protect its own own interests but uh we'll see whether you know there is a world for alibaba and amazon and google um and microsoft going forward in terms of next generation and then <clears throat> it's a sore issue for China, but that, you know, they bring this thing up. And if you take your little cover off the back of what it will say, the older models will say engineered in California, assembled in China. And so, um, you know, China would like to see it say, you know, engineered in China and uh, assembled in China. So I think that's, you know, that's part of it. The, 
in addition to the networks, the other key that is still the Western experience, but China is catching up very quickly, and that's systems integration. And that's, you know, the Germans and the Americans have unique capacities at how to make all of these things hook together, like the opening and closing of windows uh, on laptop computers. So, but it's going to be a vigorous competition. It's going to be the heart of the global economy going forward. And uh, each side will work vigorously to protect its own interests, but let's hope that there's a path forward. Thank you both. Um, so this will unfortunately be our final question as we only have a few minutes left. Um, and we will start with Mr. De Leon. So to what extent is China a threat to US security and is there greater potential for cooperation that is being ignored or dismissed? Um, so I think uh, having regular dialogues, which was the trajectory of uh, President Obama, Obama in particular, there were there was a, a strategic and economic dialogue that included both banking, uh, economic, and national security issues uh, back and forth. Um, and that's been can that was canceled by President Trump. Uh, at some point, it might be good to have those conversations reestablished. But right now, whenever the U.S. and China meet, whether it's uh, Secretary of State Tony Blinken, which was the meeting in uh, Alaska or Deputy Secretary of State Wendy Sherman's visit to Beijing. Um, the meetings tend to start out in a public way with a bit of nastiness on each other's uh, lists of grievances against the other. So if we can get back to some kind of a strategic and economic dialogue, but I think the technology competition uh, and how that unfolds is something to watch as a measure of the relationship. Yes, now, I should quickly add on to that, since Rudy, you mentioned about Alaska meeting, right? Uh, for, for the new administration with, uh, with Chinese delegates, uh, I would quickly mention that uh, Alaska, you know, Anchorage, Alaska was my first stop when I entered in the, into the US for the first time. In 1997, I, you know, I, I came to the States, right, to study. And um, at that time, you know, there's no direct flight. Uh, it's too far for the for the flights at that time. So yeah. yeah, so the flights from Shanghai to New York, it has to stop at Anchorage, you know. Uh, so so I still have that, my picture, you know, in, in, at the Anchorage. That was my first picture in the U.S. Um, so so last year when I saw the uh, new administration picked Anchorage for that meeting uh, with Chinese government, I I I had to think right there's some some good some good good thinking behind it you know there's some kind of in the middle and, uh, and we can restart that kind of conversation uh, yeah. so so I, I i i fully agree with you uh but now you know the pan pandemic makes it more difficult we're almost like yes. back to the pre-nixon time like we couldn't fly to right. each other you yeah. know so so, yep. so so but hopefully you know after the pandemic right things will mm -hmm. it will change people can meet in person and then uh, we can trust further yes. that way mm -hmm. yeah yep. great thank you yeah. Thank you all for joining us for this really important conversation, and thank you especially to our guests, Professor Winston Ma and Rudy De Leon. Uh, please join us for our next panel discussion, which will be in late March, when we explore in greater detail the future state of U.S.-China relations. Um, thank you again to everyone, and, and have a good night.